We closed our last lesson by emphasizing the fact that Jesus Christ fulfilled his promise to establish the church on the day of Pentecost. As these individuals uh, went throughout the breadth and width of the earth, the gospel was preached, congregations were established, and were organized according to the New Testament pattern that God had prescribed for it. It was not long until after the church had spread throughout uh, Asia and uh, Europe and even into various parts of the earth that concern uh, developed over the loyalty and commitment and obligation to follow the pattern that had been established. And so the apostles uh, engaged themselves in both teaching and writing about the possibility of uh, apostasy. Much of the epistles written to individual congregations was pointed to the fact that the corrupting influence of Satan that first pronounced itself in the Garden of Eden was apt to turn away many of the congregations from the simplicity that was in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote to the young evangelist Timothy and charged him to preach the word, to be instant in season and out of season, to reprove, to rebuke, with all long-suffering and doctrine. For, said the apostle, the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned unto error as fables. But he admonished young Timothy to be faithful to endure the hardships, to do the work of an evangelist, to fulfill his ministry so that he might hinder the direction in which some of the congregations were going to apostatize. But in spite of all of the warning of the apostles and the evangelists and the elders of that day, many of the congregations did not accept that admonition and began the process of slow and gradual apostasy from the pattern of the Lord. The church in the Bible is used in two, uh, two uh, senses. One of them, uh, the word church, represents the universal kingdom, the universal church, to include all people everywhere in all of the nations who have believed and obeyed the gospel. And when they do that, the Bible says the Lord adds them to the church. Well, that's the universal kingdom. But also it's used in a local sense to represent all of those who live in a local community who have obeyed the gospel and have established fellowship with one another and have agreed to continue in the apostle doctrine, breaking of bread and in prayers as the congregation in Jerusalem did. <clears throat> At this point in time, individuals begin to talk about a universal organization or an organization to control and management and manage the affairs of the universal church and moved away from the organizational pattern that the New Testament prescribed for local congregations. The Bible speaks nothing about uh, a uh, universal system of organization but it does prescribe uh, clearly and succinctly how the local congregations should be organized. And, for, and so the first movement away from the New Testament pattern was in the area of, uh, of organization. Now we read uh, earlier that the Apostle Paul left the young evangelist Titus in Crete to ordain elders in every city. 
And Luke says that Paul went uh, among the churches which he had established uh, and had appointed the elders uh, in every congregation. That seems to be the pattern that God intended that the church should follow according to organization. That it would have elders, it would have deacons, it would have uh, evangelists, and of course constituted uh, by the rank and file of the membership. But here began a movement to, to move away from the local autonomy of the church and move to a higher level or at least a different level of administration. Some of these congregations that had a plurality of elders gave accent uh, or assent to individuals to migrate to a level of presiding over the eldership. So you might have a congregation that had one elder who had uh, gravitated to a level of leadership in which he presided over the rest of them. Then he came to be known as a city bishop, and he ruled all of the uh, ecclesiastical aspects of the lives of the people in that city, like the city of Rome, or the city of Jerusalem, or the city of Alexandria, or Laodicea, or Ephesus, or wherever it might be. Then uh, later, these uh, city bishops organized themselves into a relationship with the church in which they selected uh, archbishops. And these archbishops would uh, provide, pr preside over all of the congregations and the elders in a particular province. And then the next level of administration came to be known as cardinals. And these cardinals would preside over a nation. And then these cardinals uh, reached a point in time in which they selected or chose a pope to reign over the whole system. And this resulted in what history records as the uh, papacy of the apostate church. The second thing that uh, came to be involved uh, in this was a representation by the uh, civil government uh, of influencing the uh, church to help solve some of the civil problems that had arisen in the Roman government. A controversy arose in the city of Alexandria between two of the bishops over the question of what relationship exists among God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. What position are you going to assign to God in the economy of grace? What position does Jesus Christ occupy in that uh, realm? And uh, where will you place the Holy Spirit and his work in the uh, operation of uh, religious uh, matters? Constantine was serving as the emperor of Rome at the time. And so he saw great danger in the controversy that had arisen within the apostate church. That danger would involve uh, civil affairs. And uh, his government was sagging anyway. So he decided that if this controversy arose within Christendom, that it would have an effect on uh, his government and uh, uh, the rulership which he had assumed. So he arranged to bring 318 bishops of congregations of the church uh, throughout the land to meet at Nicaea, which was a city in the province of Bithynia. Constantine not only called the conference, but he presided over the conference and pretty well uh, set the agenda and dominated the discussion. And after a long period of time in this discussion of this relationship that uh, I spoke of, they finally arrived at a consensus at least, and they wrote that consensus of the relationship among Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit by writing what they called the Nicene Creed. And into this document, they wrote their set of beliefs. 
I do not find uh, as great fault in what they said in the creed as I do in the precedent which it established. If you have a question to arise, instead of going to the Bible to find the answer to that question, they would just call a delegate assembly and determine the consensus of those delegates and whatever they decided would become the creed and that's what happened with the Nicene Creed. And the sad part of it is they continued to hold these councils and whatever the question was or whatever the problem uh, that had arisen, uh, these uh, delegates to this assembly would decide the position of the church on that matter. And so council after council, and uh, time uh, on time, they met and amended the Nicene Creed and wrote into the creed exactly what they, uh, what they wanted the position of the church to be. This then is the second area of apostasy. One in organization, which resulted in the papacy, and the second uh, in, uh, in uh, doctrine, which resulted in the power of the uh, councils to legislate and that legislation become binding upon the local congregations of the church and uh, affected the universal status of the church in, uh, in civil uh, government until finally they reached a point in which uh, the, uh, the papacy <coughs> declared itself to speak ex cathedra. That is, regardless of what God said in the Bible, we have the authority to speak as an amendment to that uh, or as uh, an overriding influence in it. There were a number of influences uh, that were brought to bear upon this uh, apostasy at this time in an effort to correct the false teachings uh, that had arisen and the corrupt practices that had uh, infiltrated uh, the uh, apostate church. Now, let me point out that in all probability, all of the known congregations of that day went in to the type of organization and accepted the uh, doctrine and practices that arose. If there were any remaining, they were underground. And in all probability, for a long period of time, there were many congregations that did go underground and tried their dead level best to keep the uh, uh, pure and undefiled religion of the Lord uh, intact. But uh, the stranglehold uh, that the uh, apostate church had on the people had to be uh, broken. And there were a number of influences that uh, came to bear upon the situation that uh, in time uh, broke that uh, uh, stranglehold. Now you have really the congregations of the church that we studied about in the New Testament and the universal church that we talked about to which God had added the saved. They had taken a new name which was a universal name as the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Now, many individuals rebelled against that system, opposed the false doctrine that had uh, crept into the findings of these councils, and opposed the corrupt practices uh, of the papacy and the kind of worship that had been uh, instituted. Now, the first of these uh, influences is known in uh, history as the papal schism. There was just a division within the papacy. There was one person who claimed as the Bishop of Rome to be the Pope over the Universal Kingdom with headquarters in Rome. And there was uh, another who claimed uh, power likewise who uh, was in Constantinople and he ruled over the Orthodox uh, Greek or Eastern Church uh, from uh, Constantinople, and another was reigning from uh, Avignon, France. So at one time in this process, you had three popes reigning over Christendom, each claiming to be a successor to Simon Peter, whom they defended as being the, uh, the first uh, Pope of Rome. So uh, Clement uh, was reigning from his headquarters in, uh, in France and uh, 
uh, John was reigning from his headquarters in uh, Constantinople, and Boniface III was ruling from uh, his quarters in France. Finally, this schism was dissolved, and the division remained between the Roman branch and the Greek branch. And the Pope in Rome reigned from uh, Italy, and the Pope in Constantinople reigned uh, from uh, Turkey. This division finally pronounced itself in 1054, in which there was a division between the Greek Orthodox and the Roman uh, Orthodox uh, uh, churches. This did not uh, quell to any great degree the advance of uh, apostasy. And the second antecedent, uh, which I uh, choose to address, that uh, precipitated reform within the system was known as the Italian Renaissance. Now the Renaissance uh, had its uh, beginning uh, primarily in Italy and was known uh, originally as the Italian Renaissance. The rise of this movement uh, brought about a revival of learning and a rebirth of nationalism. Now learning as uh, we know it today and as we knew it previous to the Dark Ages had uh, just about ceased. Very few people had access to the Bible because the Bible in its original had been translated into Latin by Jerome which he called the Latin Vulgate. And very few of the common people could read Latin and therefore did not have access to the Word of God which had been translated uh, by, jo by, uh, by Jerome. So the, the Bible which had uh, almost literally been chained to the pulpit of the church was not available to the rank and file people of the nations of the earth. But when this uh, learning was revived they began to study uh, the Hebrew language again and the Greek language again. And when they learned Hebrew, they could translate the Old Testament into their common parlance. And when they learned Greek, they could translate the New Testament into their common language. So this revival of learning and the rebirth of nationalism had a great effect on the status quo of, uh, of that day. Another thing that uh, created uh, the rise of nationalism was the opposition among the various uh, national emperors of uh, the day uh, against the uh, foreign papacy in Rome or in France or Constantinople, uh, Constantinople, wherever it was at that time. They just objected to being ser uh, subservient to, to a foreign papacy. They objected to paying taxes to the church in Rome and particularly to building some of the cathedrals and the superstructures uh, uh, that had been built uh, in that city. This uh, movement that we uh, talk about as the uh, Renaissance uh, was uh, mitigated uh, greatly by the invention of the printing press. The printing press was uh, invented uh, by John Gutenberg in uh, Germany and they were able to uh, process uh, many of the books and the pamphlets and the journals that had been published during the Renaissance and distribute them among the uh, common people. The third thing that I would point out to you is the uh, uh, European Reformation period of this time. And this was no more than an effort upon part, on the part of some of the leaders of Christendom of that day to reform the status quo. They just wanted to reform the false teaching. They wanted to reform the corrupt practices that had sprung up in the system that they had uh, found uh, existing uh, at that time. And this uh, period uh, began in the early 1300s. 
and continued uh, on into the 1700s. And so there was a period of time in which the Protestant Reformation extended its influence into most of the countries uh, of Europe or the then uh, known world. John Wycliffe in uh, 1382 translated the Jerome Latin Vulgate into the English language. And when he translated it and put it into the hands of what were known as the poor priests of England, they organized uh, what they called the Lollards. And the Lollards uh, uh, was, uh, was a group of individual poor priests who rebelled against the dominancy of a foreign power and took to themselves the responsibility of uh, teaching the common people the doctrine of Jesus Christ and the apostles. John Huss was another who led protests in Bohemia. And in 14 and 10, John, H John Huss was excommunicated by the Pope and his teachings were condemned by the Council of Constance. And uh, his uh, uh, teachings were ordered to be burned, and even Huss himself was indicted for heresy, and he was uh, burned uh, at the stake as uh, a heretic. Martin Luther was another of the great uh, European reformers who was born in Saxony, Germany, on November 10, 1483. He led the Germans against the practices of the medieval Catholic system. His most fierce opposition came not only to the reign of foreign uh, papacies, but because of some of the doctrine that had been instigated by the uh, foreign uh, papacy. And one of them in particular was the doctrine of uh, indulgences. And it came to be a practice of the church that uh, the sale of indulgences that history records uh, for us was one of the, uh, the disturbing influences uh, during this period of time. To think that an individual could buy the right to indulge in any kind of a sin he wanted to commit, commit and then by the authority of the papacy could be forgiven of that sin was just a little more than uh, Luther could tolerate. And then the doctrine of purgatory got mixed up with that, that if an individual had died without having been forgiven of his sins and his indulgences, then uh, by payment of funds or by influences otherwise, uh, they could be prayed out of purgatory to which they had gone for a period of time to be purged uh, of their sins. On October 13, uh, 15 and 17, Martin Luther wrote uh, his uh, beliefs in what he called 95 Theses. And he took this uh, document uh, of 95 Theses, which was his protest against the apostate church of that day, and nailed it to the door of the Wittenberg, Wittenberg uh, church house. Individuals read it, uh, were affected by it, uh, some uh, raised opposition to it, others uh, accepted and, and uh, followed Luther in the direction that he was going. But on July 15, 15 and 20, a papal bull was issued, and that's just an edict uh, by the Pope, a paper that he uh, issued demanding that Luther recant within 60 days. Said he, you must recant what you've been teaching, and we'll give you 60 days in which to do it, or you'll suffer severe consequences. But Luther took the papal bull, bull and instead of conceding to the wishes of the Pope, he took the papal bull and burned it in the public square near the Wittenberg church. Well, that was rebellion and heresy in the rankest uh, sort. But he continued his protest until the middle of 1521, when he was excommunicated by the Pope and banished by the emperor. 
Now he had uh, very little connections with what was going on in the status quo at this time because uh, the Pope had excommunicated him and the emperor in agreement with the ecclesiastical authority banished him from the nation uh, of Germany. He died in 1546. But by the time of his death, Lutheranism had spread throughout most of Germany, Poland, Bohemia, Hungary, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, France, and Switzerland. Another individual appeared on the scene along with uh, uh, Martin Luther. His name was Ulrich Tisvingli. He was born in 1484 in uh, Weldhaus, uh, uh, Switzerland. He became the reform leader in uh, Zurich. And John Calvin, who was born about the same time in 1509, became the leader in Geneva. Tisvingli did not agree with all that Luther taught. Calvin did not agree with all that Tisvingli taught. But their combined efforts had a great influence upon the status quo of that time. There was one area of disagreement between Luther and Tisvingli that's significant to us today. Luther proposed that the church is at liberty to practice anything that the Bible does not condemn. He, did have, he had no regard for the silence of the Bible, and if the Bible did not condemn, then he had the liberty uh, to practice that and bind it upon the congregation. Tisvingli took the opposite view. He said that the churches are licensed to teach and practice only that which the Bible requires. He says that uh, we take the commandments of the Lord at face value, we take the apostles' doctrine at face value, and that becomes the Constitution. That, became, that becomes a document by which the church shall work and worship and engage in the benevolence uh, uh, of its day. Now, by this time that Calvin died in 15 and 64, and uh, Tisvingli died in 15 and 31, the Reformation movement was well known in most parts of Europe and in England. Most of the communities and most of the local congregations had come under the influence of the protests of these men whose names I have mentioned. Now the break which came within the papacy in Rome, led by Henry VIII, was a little different to the Reformation movement led by Martin Luther and John Calvin and Ulrich Tisvingli and, uh, and John Huss and uh, John Wycliffe. His was uh, based on a little different objective than uh, these other individuals. Henry VIII had been a defender of the faith in the eyes of the papacy in Rome after he became the emperor of England. And so he was in good graces uh, of the system until the time came that he wanted to put away, put away his wife Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn, who was a, a maid in waiting in the court of, uh, of the queen, that uh, he found himself in conflict with the powers that be. He made application to Rome for a writ of divorcement, and the Pope refused to grant a writ of divorcement, and gave his reasons for not uh, approving it. Which reasons were not acceptable to the Henry, Henry VIII in any sense of the word, because he cared not about uh, why he was asking for a divorce or what the Pope thought about why he was asking for divorce. He just wanted to put away Catherine because she had not borne a male heir to the throne and marry Anne Boleyn, whom he thought would bear a male heir to the, uh, to the throne. And so uh, uh, Henry VIII called the English Parliament together and required the English Parliament to, to uh, sever its connection with the church in Rome and uh, organize the Church of England 
and ask them to make him head of the uh, church itself. So the parliament met and severed its connections and fired the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury and uh, organized the Church of England. It later became the Anglican Church and then came to America as the Episcopal Church. Now here is the weight of uh, these individuals of the Protestant uh, Reformation that was brought to bear upon individuals and upon congregations. But I would have you understand that these were men of great faith. They were men of deep conviction. They were men of sterling character. But about all they were able to accomplish through their efforts was to uh, uh, form segments of religion. What we would call today as uh, denominationalism and sectarianism. They had little effect on modifying the doctrine and practices of the Roman church. But what they did teach and what they taught the people to do and what the people did do resulted in uh, organization of denominationalism and sectarianism uh, which uh, bore the marks of the teaching of these uh, Protestant uh, reformers uh, of that day and created a system which we uh, know that exists in America today. And let me close by pointing this out to you that the followers of Luther established the Lutheran Church. The followers of Calvin established the Presbyterian Church, known for a time as the Church of Scotland. The deputies of uh, uh, Henry VIII they founded the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, uh, finally the Episcopal Church. The supporters of John Wesley established the Methodist Church and wrote uh, a discipline for it. John Merton separated uh, from uh, some of the reformers to form the first Baptist church in England. Now representatives of these groups came to America as Puritans and pilgrims and established in this new land for themselves in the early colonial system, the religious and civil government of that day. Now with the strong influences of the Catholic Church remaining and the divided conditions of Protestantism permeating the life of the early colonists and the early pilgrims and, uh, and Puritans, it remained for individuals to, uh, uh, to weigh that situation and to investigate uh, the conditions that existed and uh, issue a call for a return to the Bible to restore New Testament Christianity and thus the beginning of the restoration movement. And I hope I have connected it in such a way that you may draw a conclusion that Reformation did not succeed and that it uh, developed a condition that was deplorable, obnoxious to many of the individuals of that day and the only solution to that problem would be to abandon all of the system that's in existence and return to the Bible as a rule of faith and practice and restore New Testament Christianity as we read about it in our, in our Bibles. Thank you so much.